Then you can mix it. So, hello. Before the last lecture of the day, after a series of uh, excellent lectures, we have one more excellent. Uh, it is my great pleasure to introduce Jan Korbel from uh, Complexity Science Club. Vienna, Jan is, uh, I think, uh, one of the best, if not the best expert uh, in the field of uh, generalized entropies uh, with a very strong uh, uh, application uh research uh, currently actively working on stochastic thermodynamics uh, in the past uh, also great experience in complex networks in uh, uh, financial uh, mathematics and uh, econophysics i think that uh, we could be very very satisfied and excited about uh, his course on foundation of entropy. Today is his uh, first lecture. I would like to thank you, Jan, for coming to me. We are all happy to attend this year and to follow your Thank you very much for having me. So, first of all, thank you, Eleanor, for inviting me and uh, having the opportunity to speak to you. Um, when Werner was thinking about this idea uh, of maybe you can talk about general, like what, the, what is the foundation of entropy, I had in mind many ideas and actually entropy might be something that is so kind of controversial. On the other hand, many people can mean many different things with that, but I think it will be very useful to clarify what the, everybody means by that and what are the possible applications, what are the possible interpretations of entropy. And um, to have a little bit clear when two people are talking about entropy, what they are actually talking about. Before I start, I want to say that all these slides are available at this uh, website, slides.com slash uh, Jan I will be uh, adding more uh, as every day. So, so you can then have a look at the slides backwards. Uh, and let's start. Uh, before, I have a little warning. There is a great book uh, called State of Matter by David uh, uh, Goldstein. And he writes this introduction to the thermodynamics of statistical mechanics of the perfect dark. Ludwig Boltzmann, who spent much of his life studying statistical mechanics, died in 1906 by his own hand. Paul Ehrenfest, carrying on the work, died similarly in 1933. Now it's our turn to study statistical mechanics. And you might know this. Uh, it's so popular to me that it also uh, made it to my uh, introductory um, picture on Twitter. Don't mean that uh, you have to follow me, but in case you do, uh, I will be giving the links to the lectures. And sometimes you also see some interesting things going on, like workshops and these things. Uh, the small explanation why I have the, this uh, beer here because it's beer in Czech. The carbon in Czech means Stan Carter, beer cook. So basically, that's the, that's the reason. Uh, and uh, since this is like something um, last lecture, or like, um, yeah, before I, I start, I say no questions are stupid. So please, if you have a question, ask any time, which means there is no silly question like what this LOG means. Basically, ask anything. We are not at school. We are not grading. Ask anything. My aim is to, at the end of the, each lecture, you will know what it was about. So anytime, just raise your hand. Also applies to the, to the online participants. I will try to keep an eye in case just unmute yourself if you can and just ask anything, I'm here for that. And with that, I started a small activity. So here I bought 
uh, I brought this, this post-it, so they are relatively small. And I would like everybody to take one and write on a piece of paper, because you know each other, I unfortunately don't know you. Uh, I came today, I would like to know you a bit more. So if you could write your name, what do you study, general field, and what is entropy to you? What does it mean to you? Can be one formula, can be concept definition. And then what we will do is that after you write it, we will put the post-its here and see how it evolves. So if I can just pass it and take one, give it to the other, and then you can start writing. And you don't have to think about very much. It's not no wrong answers. If you if if you say it doesn't mean anything to me, it's also good. <laughs> yeah, if, if the professors want to take part, they don't have to. For the online participants, uh, you can write this to the chat. I will have a look at the chat after we finish here. And it doesn't have to be very sophisticated. It can be only, yeah, so there, there we have to first, some, some, I will, for the online participants, after we finish, I will try to add the, like write the post-its for you and put it to the, there, there, there is, uh, there is a whiteboard where we put all the, all the answers. Uh, just first name, not last name. You can, it can be just first name. Yeah, write simply the first name. And, and, and you don't have to be very specific about your field, just write physics, mathematics, computer science, finance, biology. And maybe once you, yeah, we will wait until everybody finished. And no, I would be nice if, if everybody just quickly comes here. Tell us their name, their, what they do, and what the entry means for them. And just then post it here. So whoever's ready, let's let's start this quick thing. Yeah. So maybe you can read it. Uh, uh. So I trust you to measure of low and high tenders of system. Okay, so you are, you, and you say my mathematics and your marks here. Nice to meet you. Okay. So come, come, come. It, it, yeah, whoever has it done, please come. I'm young and mm -hmm. average. I say director biophysics and entropy to me is some kind of a measure of disorder that can only increase at least for okay. our systems. Okay, nice. Mm -hmm. Next one. Yeah, so my name is Dana, and uh, I study physics. Because mm -hmm. uh, uh, yes, and uh, I just think it's a story. Okay, nice. Somebody else? Yeah, come. Okay. This is the second law of thermodynamics. Very nice. My name is Peter. I'm a theoretical physicist. Uh, for the entropy measure yeah, okay. so this is very nice. Now we'll get to the chat very quickly. Okay. My name is Miguel. I work in the thermodynamics and particle coping and for the entropy disorder by the measure of certain mm -hmm. Great. Minutes. Yeah, we start. I study statistics and Oh, yeah. My name is Maria. I studied physics. Um, I have a book for the Great. Uh, my name is Jose. I'm from the physics. I'm from the My name is Ipina. I'm the undergraduate in the physics and entropy is measurement of this issue. Great. Thank you. Great, thank you. Great. Okay, where to put it? Very well. This is today. My name is Paul. Uh, be it's part of the business. And the short answer be is uh, all about the uh, of time. Great. Yeah. Very nice. My name is Elena. I study physics. I'm from the University of Great. Thank you. 
in uh, the chat, so I will read them loud. So there is Premasis uh, Kumar, non-equilibrium thermodynamics, and equilibrium dynamics. Uh, uh, there is Lyle Canus, uh, that is physics, and uh, it, the entropy is the Boltzmann formula, log times multiplicity, or the measure of uncertainty. Bianming Gyang, that is physics, the same answer. So young, uh, stereotypical physicist, and uh, entropy is microstates, ignorance when describing systems in thermodynamic state variables. Uh, no, he studies subatomic physics, and entropy is amount of disorder of the system. There is Kirill, who is data scientist and statistician, and entropy is information gain. Uh, for uh, Remarsis, uh, it's the entropy is underlying physical constraint of the universe. Very nice. Lucas, relativistic statistical mechanics, and is the quantity that measures information or lack of. So thank you very much for these answers. I'm really glad that you had such a variety of answers. Uh, so my answer to that is that for me, the entropy is this uh, Boltzmann constant times log of the multiplicity. And this is something that is written on Boltzmann's uh, gravestone. Boltzmann gravestone is on the Central Cemetery in Vienna, Central Friedhof. Uh, I would really recommend to go there. So if you have a little bit more time in Vienna, recommend going to Friedhof. You can go there by train because uh, Vienna has this very interesting policy that uh, if you are a famous person, they give you what they call Ehrenkraben, which means this is a great honor. So there is a special like uh, group of graves where all <laughs> the famous people like Mozart, Beethoven, all of the famous people lie. So there's, there are even tours there and you will find out that uh, very close to all of these guys is the um, grave of Boltzmann where he has this, uh, this equation, although some people say uh, he didn't invent it. Well, we will see in this uh, lecture a bit later. So this is me and my youngest daughter. Uh, and uh, why there are so many definitions or why there are so many things. So I basically went to Wikipedia and there is a, so I, I took only very, so if you, if you look at the, the, uh, the entropy, there is a, some creation. And you can write that uh, really that entropy is the original property used to explain part of internal energy of a thermodynamic system as that this is the unavailable source for useful work. And then there are other applications and there are not these three, there are like three dozen, I would say at least. And one of them is from classical thermodynamics. One of them is from statistical thermodynamics. One of them is from entropy. And uh, they are all maybe different, maybe similar. And I think that our aim is to really find out how they are similar and how they are different. And I will start with an interesting paper that is written by my colleagues, Stefan Bernhardt and Rudy, 
there is called pre phase entropy for competition. And we will see that the entropy maybe has more than one phase, which means that it has more than one origins. And then in certain cases, these more phases try to, will be the same. In other patients, they will be different and we will see the relations. What I also did, I did this work out of the and of the Wikipedia page uh, entropy, and you will see uh, that there are many concepts we've mentioned. So entropy uh, is this place that is some uh, comment. So sorry yeah. for this. Uh, thermodynamics, temperature uh, change. Also, we see letters like S, W, X, delta, K, Q. Thermodynamics, energy, system, heat, physics. So many things that you've mentioned. I try to maybe uh, do a few of them. So I, I thought, what would somebody describe as an entropy? Is it measure of randomness or disorder? Maybe maximum data compression, distance from equilibrium, information content, part of the internal you know, energy that is unavailable for useful work. Is it uncertainty, heat or temperature? Uh, that heat over temperature is also something that, that many people wrote in here. Is it energy dispersion? Or maybe is it just a tool that can be used, like in maximum entropy principle, that you use the entropy to infer the maximum entropy uh, distribution, maximum caliber, or is it just the way that Prigogine used it to define this minimum entropy production principle? Or is it softmax that uh, in statistics is basically this is the statistic version of maximum entropy principle that uses this technique to estimate distribution from the data? Or uh, is it some a principle called maximum entropy production that some people claim it exists in the mean system? That's all people can think of, and we will see whether uh, we are. What, what, of, what of these, how these concepts are connected or whether they are or not. Uh, when I was thinking about entropy, I was thinking about my personal journey. How did I get involved with entropy? And I was thinking uh, that during my studies, my point of view to the entropy changed. Because when you start, uh, it, during during so and this is a warning it's the physics course so I, I did the physics program during the typical physics program you meet entropy several times and it goes and goes away and then with different uh, approach or different point of view you think about the entropy maybe as different concept or as a differently powerful concept so i want to start with my personal opinion about the entropy and what it can do in physics so in summer semester of first year, my virtual physics studies, uh, I studied classical thermodynamics. And here is what many people wrote there. So the del delta S is this dq over dt, where this d and delta are different things. And this is something called the exact and non-exact differential forms, which at that time I had no idea what they what it means. But I, 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 I saw that it's useful because you can measure with that uh, specific heat. You can do various fancy equations, which is the second, uh, second uh, part of the Maxwell's equation, or like it, 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 it both these. And I said, yeah, it's kind of quite good. And in the second year, we, I had, we had a course on statistical physics. And basically, the first half was just a repetition of what we already did in the first year. The second half was very interesting because there was a teacher that came, introduced us with this entropy principle, introduced the partition function, which is the sum over the space, which comes from the German to uh, sum, so sum of the, all the states. Uh, and I thought, okay, so now I have basically the concept, like I, I can do everything. So I just calculate one function, which is the partition function. And then this is the holy grail of, of the physics. Uh, at that time, again, we had a problem that we didn't know any probability theory, but yeah, doesn't matter so much. Uh, 
So I thought, yeah, this is really powerful. Wow. In the third year, we I also came across, and now I'm sorry to people who do quantum mechanics, but um, I basically we did this density matrix uh, theory and entropy, but there was nothing at that time. There was nothing extra, so it was basically the same written in different language. So you change some for trace and uh, p for row, and that was it. Uh, so I wasn't uh, very much impressed. However, in um, master studies, I was lucky that I did my one semester in Berlin. Somebody is here from Berlin. So I did uh, one exchange here in Berlin at FU, so Freie Universität Berlin. And then I, got, I, I took a course on advanced statistical physics where I understood that it's not. So easy to calculate the partition function. We did this Fermi Dirac and Bose Einstein statistics and all this spin easing model and transit matrix theory for 2D and was super complicated. And real gas and the expansion. And this was where too, too, too hard. But I got a like, non mandatory voluntary course on non equilibrium statistical physics. And then I've learned about um, the linear response theory, molecular motors, so how the motors work in our cells, uh, how the fluctuation terms work in our cells. And finally, what I got is the time. So, you know, thermodynamics is called thermodynamics, but it can be, uh, there is no time, there is no dynamics. That it should be more like thermostatics or something like that. And here I finally got the time. And that's why I fell in love with uh, statistical mechanics and entropy in particular. So um, if you don't mind, I think there is somebody better who can explain you a part of uh, physics that was motivated, motivation for entropy from the macroscopic point of view. And I really like this and it has only 15 minutes. So, and I hope. I remember when I first learned about the laws of thermodynamics. The second one was really confusing because it was about entropy. The entropy of the closed system only in the free, where the entropy is the messiness or the disorder of the system. And I thought, how in the world did anyone come up with an equation for messy? And why in the world would anyone come up with an equation? For messiness. And how did scientists start to believe, as the singer David Byrne said from the top of head, <laughs> we have to turn to a German scientist named Rudolf Klaas, who has this amazing ability to make almost every scientist around him think he was wrong for decades before they finally realize he's fundamentally correct. Ready for the story? Let's go. So I really recommend this channel about history of physics, not only physics. I'd like to start in 1849, when Rudolf Clausius was a 27-year-old high school teacher. 1849 was when Clausius read a paper about the theories of heat of a long-deceased French scientist named Sadi Carnot. Clausius decided that some of Carnot's ideas were correct. But he disagreed with the idea that heat is always conserved. In 1850, Clausius published his theory that we currently believe is true, that heat can be converted into work and work into heat. Clausius wasn't the first to promote the idea of heat work equivalent, but he was the first to say that it did not require one to cast the theory of Carnot overboard, but merely the idea that no heat is lost. In addition, Clausius added a new term, which was a combination of what he called the interior work and the interior heat, that we now call the internal energy. With this term, Clausius became the first person to publish a complete version of the first law of thermodynamics, although he didn't use the word energy for a further 13 years, as the term energy was just becoming popular in the 1850s and 60s. An equation that Clausius created is still used to describe the first law with the same letters and sign conventions today. 
Clausius's publication made his name in science, and soon he earned a job as a professor, but it also earned him some enemies. In Scotland, William Thompson, whose paper initially sparked Clausius's interest, thought that Clausius was just reiterating the work of a disheveled Scottish scientist named William Rankin and advised Rankin to send a letter to the editor to that effect. In Germany, a scientist named Hermann Helmholtz had just written a paper on the conservation of energy and felt that Clausius was just copying him. In addition, all three men decided that whatever Clausius had not plagiarized was just dead wrong. And for many, many years, Clausius could not publish anything without letters from Thompson, Rankin, or Helmholtz, or more complaining about it. I tend to side with Clausius on this one. In fact, as far as I can tell, Clausius's paper of 1850 is startling in its accuracy and its importance. I'm not alone in this assessment. In 1980, a historian wrote the following. There is no doubt that Clausius, with this paper of 1850, created classical thermodynamics. All proceeding except Carnot's is of small moment. Also, all three men eventually ended up agreeing with Clausius, although they always kept some disdain for the originality of his argument or the strength of his position. Years later, Thompson wrote, quote, the memoir of Clausius contains the most satisfactory and nearly complete working out of the theory of most power of heat, but his hypothesis is so mixed that the general fact is lost. It probably didn't help that Thompson and Helmholtz specifically were both known for their charm and charisma, and Clausius's personality was the mostly lost to time, aside from his brother saying he was a man of rare modesty, his son writing, that the most principal trait in my father's character was, without doubt, the splendid truthfulness of his nature, and a letter from a student years later that described Clausius as, quote, that old grouch. Eventually, both Helmholtz and Thompson were knighted. Helmholtz became Hermann von Helmholtz, and Thompson became Lord Kelvin, like the temperature scale that is named after him. Despite the attack, Clausius continued to publish his theories on heat. In 1854, Clausius published his fourth paper on heat, and this is the one where he created entropy. Well, sort of. In this paper, Clausius said that there are already two rules. The first one is the one that heat can be converted into work and work into heat. The second one was Carnot's theorem that heat engines only work because the heat flows from the hot source to the cold sink, and the amount of heat you get is dependent on the temperature of cold sources. Clausius felt, however, that Carnot's theorem in this form is incomplete because we cannot recognize therein with sufficient clearness the real nature of the theorem and its connection with the first fundamental theorem. What to do? Clausius knew that Carnot had made this hypothetical cycle where if you did it one way, heat would create work. And if you did it the other way, work would create heat. This is currently called the Carnot cycle. Clausius decided there must be some mathematical way to make two heat transformations equivalent. So if you did them in the opposite order, they would work in the opposite way. He also determined that this equivalence function had to be a function of the heat and the temperature. He also noted that less heat at lower temperatures was equivalent to more heat at higher temperatures. So the temperature must be in the denominator. He therefore decided that the function he was working with, Q over T, where Q is the heat, and T is most likely, quote, simply the absolute temperature. Clausius also defined the equivalence value of heat going from temperature one to temperature two as Q times one over T2 minus one over T1 and gave the letter n for the sum of equivalence values, which he generalized as the integral of the element of heat over temperature. Note from the present, this function, the heat over the absolute temperature, is an equation for entropy, <laughs> although Clausius didn't call it entropy yet. Clausius decided that if the process was reversible, then the sum of these functions must add to zero. Here's his logic. He said, imagine it wasn't true and the equivalent value was negative. If that was the case, then the value of 
the heat times one over T2 minus one over T1 would also have to be less than zero for some part of it, which means that heat would have to flow from the lower temperature to the higher temperature, which is not possible to the Carnot's theory. He then added, if the sum was positive, then you do the process in reverse, and then the sum becomes negative, and once again, you get heat flowing from low temperatures to high temperatures, which is a no-no. Ergo, no matter how complicated a cycle is, if it is reversible, then the equivalent value must add to zero. Clausius added that if a process was irreversible, meaning you couldn't do it backwards, you couldn't get a negative equivalent value for the same reason, but you could get a positive one. He therefore concluded with his second law of thermodynamics, quote, the algebraic sum of all transformations occurring in a cyclical process can only be positive. By the way, I was taught that he can't flow by itself from a cold object to a hot object because it violates the second law of thermodynamics. But in studying Clausius, I found the reverse to be true, meaning Clausius based his ideas of entropy, or what he called at the time equivalence value, on the principle that heat cannot flow from a cold object to a warmer object by itself. And he got that idea from Savi Carnot. Fast forward eight years to 1862. That's when Clausius wrote a paper about the equivalence value, cost cost entropy, for a system that didn't go in a full circle but started at one temperature state and ended up at another temperature state. Clausius decided that heat usually increases the mean distance between molecules, which he called the disgregation. If you've never heard that term, it's because we no longer use it, by the way. Clausius also noted that water is strange and that when ice melts, the molecules actually get closer together instead of further apart. So he added that in that case, the disgregation is not accompanied by an increase of the mean distances of the molecule. Therefore, Clausius's disgregation had to do with either the separation of the molecules or their orderliness. Clausius became the first to state that one could determine the entropy from the arrangement of molecules inside a box, even if you don't know how much heat it absorbs. Also, when Clausius looked at a single transformation, he realized that a general property of transformation is that a negative transformation can never occur without a simultaneous positive transformation whose equivalence value is at least as great. On the other hand, positive transformations are not necessarily accompanied by negative transformations of equal value, but may take place in conjunction with smaller negative transformations or even without any at all. Clausius concluded the algebraic sum of all transformations occurring during any change of condition, whatever, can only be positive or, as an extreme case, equal to nothing. In other words, entropy of a closed system can only increase. And that's not all. Way back in 1862, some 50 years before Walter Nurse produced it, he came up with the third law of thermodynamics too, writing, quote, it may be proved to be impossible practically to arrive at the absolute zero temperature by any alteration of the condition of a body. Three years later, in 1865, Clausius published his ninth paper on heat. In this one, he said he was motivated by the desire to, quote, bring the second fundamental theorem, which is much more difficult to understand than the first, to its simplest and at the same time most general form. This paper is mostly important for the new terminology because this is the paper where he renamed the equivalence value to be the shorter term entropy and gave it the letter S for no reason I can tell. We still use the letter S for entropy because of Clausius. Clausius said that he picked the term entropy from the Greek word for transformation and he, quote, intentionally formed the word entropy so as to be as similar as possible to the word energy. Clausius then concluded with his version of the two laws of thermodynamics. One, the energy of the universe is constant, and two, the entropy of the universe tends to a maximum. Clausius's version of the two laws of thermodynamics that he wrote down in 1865 
are still considered correct today. Meanwhile, William Thompson, one of Clausius's big critics, was working on his own version of the second law of thermodynamics, albeit one without an equation. Years before, in 1852, Thompson wrote that there was always a waste of mechanical energy available to man when heat is allowed to pass from one body to another at a lower temperature. By 1862, Thompson declared that the second great law of thermodynamics involves a certain principle of irreversible action in nature. It is thus shown that although mechanical energy is indestructible, there is a universal tendency to its dissipation, which produces a gradual augmentation and diffusion of heat, cessation of motion, and exhaustion of potential energy through the material universe. With entropy, Clausius had given the irreversible action of nature an equation and a name. The way you say, or maybe you say, heat over temperature is not the equation I learned for entropy. That's probably because you and I were taught Boltzmann's entropy equation. You won't be surprised to learn from its name that Clausius did not create Boltzmann's entropy equation. But you might be surprised to learn that Boltzmann didn't create it either, even though it is carved on his gravestone. So how did we get from Clausius to Boltzmann's equation? And how did Boltzmann get an equation written after him, a constant named after him that he didn't directly create? That's next time on The Lightning Chamber. If you're interested, I already have a video about the first Okay, so um, I recommend to you watching the other video about Boltzmann, although I don't think everything is correct in that video. Uh, I will tell you my version of uh, how, or like I will not go too much to the history, but I, there, are, there are some things that, that might not be uh, correct. For example, that, that the statement that Boltzmann wasn't using the entropy in his form, that's not true. Uh, the truth is that, that the Boltzmann constant was named after Planck. So, so Planck basically named it after, after Boltzmann. There were two reasons because, uh, or like he, he started using it and at later time, it was fashion to give Constant's name and Planck already had one constant, yeah. which yeah. is the H bar. So it was a good choice. But the reason why Boltzmann entropy Many people claim it, it wasn't invented by Boltzmann is mainly because most of this, his texts are in German. So for many people, hard to read his original papers. Um, good. Um, so in this video, we um, basically, there are two motivations or like in the end of 19th century, there are two main motivations for uh, investigating entropy. And the first, comes with, um, let me put it somewhere. Good. So uh, basically, scientists were, or physicists were interested in relation between energy, heat, work, and temperature. And this is all the stuff that is connected to the thermodynamics. So it's what we wrote there is delta S is equal to dt over t. And it was mainly the work of Clausius, Kelvin, von Helmholtz, and Carnot. You know these names from uh, if you had courses on statistical mechanics, there are certain things named after these people. Um, and the second one is for us maybe more interesting because of the relation between microscopic and macroscopic. And this is this has been done by like investigated by Maxwell, Boltzmann, Planck, and, and Gibbs who popularize it the most. And I think that this is the fundamental way because although thermodynamics is very powerful, it's still a phenomenological theory that basically uh, just observe the macroscopic variables and doesn't go to, to really microscopic foundations. And what not we will do now in this lecture, we will try to follow the path of Boltzmann and Maxwell and these guys to maybe think how we can connect the microscopic motion of particles with the macroscopic. And the question is, okay, why statistical physics? Uh, 
if you had a course on uh, fascicular quantum mechanics, then you know that, that the motion of these particles is given by either Lagrangian or Hamiltonian or Newtonian uh, formulation of the mechanics. You have the equations of motion. Uh, you can write down theoretically a Hamiltonian for two to the 24 uh, particles if you want. You might be even able to solve it uh, theoretically. Uh, but the problem is that uh, this is first not the case that you can solve it, even, even not numerically, because it's such a large amount of data. And second, most important, you are typically not interested in solving these equations because they don't give you so much interesting information. Uh, you don't need to know uh, the velocity and position of every particle here in the room to, to know how, whether the heat flows or whether the energy flows from your body or to your body. So that's maybe not too much information that is not useful. And third is that if you have a, a one body problem, so if you have one particle, then basically it's typically solvable. I mean, solvable in the sense that you can write out the differential equation and you can, you can uh, solve it in so-called quadrature. So you can write the integral for the solution. If you have two body problem, you can do this transformation to the center of mass. Uh, and then you have center of one, one, uh, one coordinate is center of mass, and the, the, the second is the distance between the particles. For free body problem, the generally, general solution is in general not found. And what we do if we have n body problem, we have 10 to 24. Uh, and the more important question is do we need to solve this? Uh, in most cases, probably not. So. Uh, just start with a brief recap on what we know from uh, from classical term from classical mechanics. If you had the uh, what is the Liouville so-called Liouville theorem, so you have the canonical coordinates, so you have the conjugate position and momentum, and then uh, you have an initial probability distribution over the positions and momenta in time. What the Liouville theorem tells us is that basically the probability distribution in this phase space is conserved. But it means that if you take any volume in the phase space and transform it according to the equations of motion, the volume remains constant, which then means that uh, the trivial con uh, consequence of this is that the entropy, the change of the entropy is zero. Basically, uh, by plugging to this formula, you, you find out that the entropy when you, your only uncertainty is the probability, initial probability of the system, otherwise you know everything about the position of momenta, then uh, you basically the entropy is constant. And this is, this is the, the picture that, that is showing it that if you have this small rectangle, it gets deformed in, in, in time maybe, but the volume is constant. Uh, so it means that the entropy is not useful? Mm, not really, because typically we either do not have the whole information about the trajectories, or we don't want to it, or it's too much, and we are maybe not so interested in. And here I mentioned two interesting results, or like two useful results from statistics, which is the uh, law of large numbers, which means that if you repeat something many times, you basically, and, and then, calculate the average value, then it basically, uh, you will get the mean value. So, uh, by, and this is, this, is, this is this graph. So it means that by repeating many experiments, you will eventually arrive to the average value. And we also know how fast you arrive there uh, because it, you, the, the standard deviation goes with square root of n. Uh, of course, you can pay yeah, this has some uh, assumptions. Uh, here is the uh, uh, independent and identical distributed uh, random variables. Yes, it doesn't have to be identically distributed. There are some uh, generalizations of these terms for not identically distributed variables, but the independence is of course very important. And sometimes you will see that the correlations change the game, but let's maybe not consider this at this moment. And uh, 
The consequence of when you have a large number of systems, they can be typically described by very few parameters, like a box of uh, with one more of gas particles. And now I go a little bit forward. You know that the average velocity is determined by the temperature because the temperature somehow plays the role in these uh, statistical terms. Uh, also useful, something that we will need um, a bit later is a so-called bars and stars theorem. And in the, when counting the state, we will need to basically calculate uh, if we have states, like let's say coins, K coins, and we want to put them into N boxes. And in the box, there doesn't have to be any coin, but can be one, two, three, et cetera. Coin. So I think you know these equations. It, uh, it's called combination with repetition or something like that. And people do these proofs with these bar stars. You can have, I, I don't know, races and some books or something like that. So I just remind you that uh, we will need this formula a few times in this lecture. I will refer it as a bars and stars theorem. And now, uh, why we need this statistical physics is the concept course called coarse graining. So everything here, all the particles can be described by quantum mechanics. So you have the particles, I don't want to go to quantum field theory. So let's say you have the particles, they have some interactions and maybe you will be able to describe it by the play function. Great. Can you solve it? For few particles, maybe yes. For more of particles, no. And also you will not see the interesting properties of the, of the material, which is maybe hidden or emerging on higher scales. So what people typically do is that depending on their scale of interest or their phenomenon of interest, they core grain the system up to a certain scale where you have atoms, you have molecules, you have colloidal particles, you have cells, you have um, maybe then individual people, you have societies, you have planets, you have galaxies, and et cetera, to describe the phenomena they are interested in, because you cannot use the whole machinery of the all other scales, although it's somehow encoded in your effective theory, uh, because you will be lost. There's typically not possible to, so each theory, although not explicitly said, works on a specific scale, time and space scale, where you can solve things and where you see this characteristic phenomena. If you go to other scale, typically it's either too difficult or doesn't bring so much many new, new information, or you can do many things with that. And the importance is that if you do this course training, maybe you will find that you start with some states. There are many, 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 many states. And then by course graining, you end with less state. Maybe what happens is that this one coarse grain state corresponds to many microscopic states, while the other corresponds to maybe other number of this microscopic states. And these numbers are not the same. And now we are again back to the fact that you have many, uh, many, many dices, and you, you, you roll the dice many times. And while you can see different numbers on the dices, if you calculate this average value, then you always get very similar number or uh, very similar, like the number that, that is quite similar. Here, I mentioned one thing that maybe some people will talk not about cross training, they will talk about ignorance, which means that. It's just how much you know about the system or a preparation procedure that it's about your, um, that you cannot prepare your system perfectly or, and it means that maybe course training is special type of that. I think this, um, this is something that uh, can be seen as an alternative approach to it. It goes more to a philosophical uh, point of view. I, see it more or less equivalent. So when we try to do the modeling and not uh, maybe like the foundational part, I think they are almost identical, but I mention it here because some people will say, no, of course, grain is not what is causing the entropy, but uh, 
the calculation and, and uh, the formulas were the same. So if you want some other interpretation, uh, go ahead. Uh, and I also um, here specifically mention what it means in thermodynamics that, uh, of course, in thermodynamics, you start typically with microscopic systems uh, described by classical mechanics. And then what statistical mechanics does is that, that it connects the, the microscopic theory of thermodynamics where you have only few functions with this microscopic. And, and this is what the statistical mechanics does uh, that this, this calculates this probability distribution, plugs it back, and then you end with thermodynamics. Then what you heard last week is the stochastic thermodynamics where you have some intermediate uh, approach that you have some coarse graining, but you know something about the system, not only the macroscopic quantities, but you know, the, for example, the probabilities of trajectories and these things. So there, it is somewhere in between, which is typically very useful for many applications. And now uh, I have to say that so now I start explaining the key concepts that will be useful for our definition of entropy. And it's the distinction between microstates, mesostates, and macrostates. And basically, we can continue on this uh, example with the dices. So we know that dice has six states, if it's this basic one, this cubic one. And then basically, we can throw it a few times, so let's say five times. And I throw a sequence of four, two, six, two, five. And there are many microstates. The microstate means that it's the exact sequence of these dices. So it's really that, that you can think about it as a time series if you want, that is the order of how you measure, uh, how you throw it. The number of microstates is here six to five because each time I can throw six, like, choose from six possible values uh, to the five, so six times six times six, it's over 7,000. Now the middle state is something that I basically measure how many times uh, each number uh, occurred. So I, in this case, I say uh, I, 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 the number two occurred two times, number one, zero times, number three, zero times, and four, five, six each one time. So it's something people in statistics call histogram because it's really the frequency of how many throws I did. Um, if you calculate the number of these middle states, again, here comes the, the stars and bars uh, theorem. Uh, you, can, you can easily do it. And I think you did it during the, the combinatorics classes. It's this combination number. And for this case, it's 252. So it's much less than this 7,000. So if you do the coarse graining, it means that uh, basically there are more, there is more than one and many more than one possibility for each histogram. So basically when you take all the sequences, many sequences go to the same histogram and it's clear. So if you can, you can exchange, for example, do the permutation of, of, of the row, of the, of the, of the throws, et cetera. And then we can do even more cost grading. This is something that we discussed before. If I'm interested only in the average value here, it's 3.8. And the number of microstates is basically 25. Uh, so it's again, yet another cost grading. And this sequence of 7,225, this is what is crucial for our uh, cost grading and distinction between micro, meso, and macro. And now, Imagine that I had not five. I, I have not five uh, dices. I had one mole of dices, so two to the twenty-four. Then the, the, the difference between the numbers is even more pronounced, and it's like extreme. So so really, the 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 set containing to one mesostate, my uh, one histogram, will be extremely large. And this is basically this counting is what create this entropy and I will explain why. Because now if we want to define multiplicity, this W that Osman did is basically the amount of microstates with the same mesostates or macrostates. Uh, so now we get back to the formula on Boltzmann's grade. And the question is how do we calculate this multiplicity for this case? So answer, the short answer is see the combinatorics lecture. 
Uh, well, the full answer is that what we should do is that we do all the fermentation, but we should take care of our counting, which means that if I have this, this sequence where there are two twos, if I change these two dices, this is basically the same sequence. So I have to exclude these permutations where I permute the two dices with the same value. So what I do here is that the permutation of all the states is five factorial, this is 120, and our counting is the permutation of just this two, so it's two factorial, then the multiplicity of this histogram is five factorial over two factorial, so it's 60. Good. Uh, so now the general formula for, uh, let's say, a histogram where I have n1 states of one, uh, nk states of k, where the, 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 this n, the capital N, is the sum of all n i, is the total, total frequency, is given by this formula. So you can easily think about it. So it's n factorial over the product of n i factorial. And now the question at stake is, why I take clock? Uh, the succinct reason is that log transforms products to sums, which are much easier to handle. Oh. Ah, is it working now? I think so. Good. But there is also a physical reason, which is called that if you have a multiplicity of uh, this joint system that do not interact with each other, you can easily think that it's a product. So it means that then the log of this product is the sum, which then gives this rise of this extensive versus intrinsic thermodynamic variables. So we will see that the entropy and energy is extensive and the temperature is intensive, which means that the temperature basically, uh, you can measure the temperature. It means that the entropy of two systems that have the same entropy and energy and number of particles is the same. So it's, it's zero for all thermodynamics. But at this point, we can say it's because it's easier to calculate. Good. So then uh, we do what Boltzmann did. And the other did so basically use the scaling approximation. So basically replace the log n factorial by n log n minus n and denote the sum as n. And what we end with here is that we replace now the ni over n by pi by a letter pi. And then we see that the log of nr, log of w is minus n pi log pi. So now the question is that some people call the sum pi log pi Gibbs entropy in this case, because in information there is called channel entropy. And there are two questions. So first is what is actually pi? The second question is, so does it mean that Boltzmann entropy and Gibbs entropy are the same? And I'm not posing it because uh, I would be the first one who asked. Um, now, I want to say something about the probability and the two approaches. So the ones who are statisticians here, you know that there are two uh, approaches to entropy, uh, to probability. So one is the frequentist approach, where you basically the probability is this limiting success value of repeated experiment. So it's really the consequence of low of large numbers. So here, what the PI would be is really this, this limiting value from the repeating experiment. So really the, the frequency. Uh, here it doesn't make sense to, so this is why frequentists do not like the parametric uh, models because it doesn't make any sense to consider a parametric distribution. And by a same approach, the probability quantifies the uncertainty about the experiment. And here we are whether, again, back to the discussion whether what is the entropy but uh, let's keep it uh, simple for here. Here, the Bayesian approach tells us that this is the knowledge about the system. So we have this bias rule that you have the prior distribution, 
likelihood ratio and the posterior. So the posterior is the updated probability distribution uh, when um, we observe something about the system. And uh, of course, using the saying that the NI over N is the PI, is the probability, is the frequentist approach. And what the people were thinking about is the thermodynamic limit. So uh, at that time, uh, people were thinking about uh, more molecules, so large number of molecules. This is something that's called thermodynamic limit. So in practice, so in theory, you send N to infinity. In practical situation, you say N is much larger than one, much, 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 much larger. Uh, so there are a few natural questions. Does it mean that the entropy can be used only in thermodynamic limit? And does the entropy measure the uncertainty of a single particle in large system that somehow some, some is like some kind of uh, average probability over many particles? So it means that is the probability that, that we define a probability for one particle or for all particles? And it's a good question, but the answer is, it depends how you define your state. Uh, and here I mentioned that uh, this was something that people were really interested in 50s, 60s. This is paper by James, who distinguishes the, the Gibbs entropy, which is the entropy of a particle multiplicity versus the n times the one particle multiplicity. And here he writes that they are not the same and they are the one is bigger or equal than the other. And the question is, you had a course, I hope on information theory, does somebody recognize what uh, this difference uh, is, uh, it, it means in information theory? No. What? Uh, no. Not exactly. No. Ah, yeah, no. it's a mutual no. information. It's a mutual information if you think about it. And this is, I have, I, sorry. But you were right with the Kulbach Kleiber entropy because the mutual information is a special type of Kulbach Kleiber entropy where you take one, one distribution as a joint one and the uh, other as the product of the marginal one. So you were right. Uh, but it's the special case which is called mutual information. In case of more than two events, it's called multi information, right? So yeah, that's it. So I have a question. Yes. I don't see a difference between the Gibbs entropy and the Boltzmann entropy right now. Um, yes, so basically this is the so this is the multiplicity, and maybe in the next slide it's we, we the, are with an uh, integer number, no? Then oh yes, so basically the, this is this should be the multiplicity of the n particle ensembles. Here the, the W1 this the uh, should be the multiplicity of one particle uh, in different states and I will explain this in the next slide, what is meant by that, is the resolution is that you have to really think about, yes? Yeah? I have a stupid question. Yeah? Uh, there must be questions. <laughs> yes. Oh. Yeah, so. I have a single quantity in trouble. That's a loss of mechanism. Is it a function of possibility? Uh, the partial answer is that, so some theories like thermodynamics or uh, maybe quantum mechanics are independently uh, discovered by several people. And they came with very similar yet a bit different ideas. And at that point, they basically called entropy something that looked at the first sight very similar. So everything that has this form P log P or N log N, X log X, is nowadays called entropy. Not always, but it might be a case. And this is the reason that here, for example, you see that, that here is the case. So here, this, this is the Boltzmann I showed in the previous slide. This is something that I didn't show, although I, I, I claim that I might have shown it because here it's not about the formula, it's about the definition of your state because what did we define as a state? So here we have had states as a single state of the dice. And then we repeated the experiment. What if, if we threw the dice two times, two, two dices at once? 
and then our state will be uh, like a pair of one dice, second dice. You can do it with three dice, with n dice, so then the state space grow faster. And here, of course, because the dice are independent, and you will see, and I think that they write it here, so they are the same if the product is. So the product, so the joint distribution is the product of marginal. So if the events are independent, then you will end with the same with the same uh, formula. So these two are have the same value. But maybe if you introduce something, I will also show later, that this uh, this throws are correlated. Maybe it's a bit more important that you throw the same numbers than by chance. Then basically this marginal approach will not describe the whole whole feature. So basically, if we talk about the entropy as the as, as the feature of the whole system, we either have to be pretty sure that that all these small particles are more or less independent, or we have to use this approach where there are many, many, many more states and it's much more difficult to calculate, as we will see. And besides that, then you will see in other lectures that there are like other people like James who found out in information during the same formula. And then there is this funny story that uh, von Neumann replied that he should call it entropy because there is this thing and nobody knows what it is. Because at the time they didn't, they were not sure whether this is the same quantity or not. And that's why it still remains somehow buried under this, you know, theory, and that's why many people, if they talk about different entropy, they can mean different things. Uh, this is related to the thing called a Gibbs paradox. I don't want to go uh, into so much detail. Basically, it means that if you have two boxes and, and there is a barrier, you remove the barrier, let it diffuse, come back by calculating the, the, the entropy, then before and after you get some paradoxical behavior, there is some resolution to it. Uh, but I think uh, that this is also uh, partially due to the proper counting of the state, which is a bit more difficult if you have, for example, canonical uh, states. So if you have continuous state space, it's, it's a bit more difficult to calculate such uh, an entropy. I, here I mentioned two other things uh, that I will need because later uh, that are important. So here we see that if we have two independent systems, the entropy is additive. So uh, this is what we saw. So for two independent systems, the log of product is sum of logs and it's extensive. So uh, if you, I have k times particles, it should be k times more entropy. And I'm done with the with the this talk. And after each talk, I would like to have a very short summary. If you just I don't know raise your hand or write to chat or something, uh, if you tell me one more one thing that was either surprising to you, that was useful to you, or maybe that you didn't like, would be great to have some feedback also for the others. Is it something that uh, during this talk that was useful for you? Something that was not useful? Something that was surprising? Yeah? I don't think I was uh, aware of that it was from Gibbs. Uh, yes, yes, yeah. yes. This also because the Gibbs, then um, I will probably talk about it a bit later. Also, Boltzmann was interested in chemical reactions. But what Gibbs did is that he introduced this grand canonical ensemble where you can exchange particles. So sometimes people call this Gibbs entropy, but I mean, this is also a bit changing uh, from author to author. Is it something? Yeah. yeah I, I like the illustration of the new micro meso uh, space from the dice. Yes. Yeah. Thank you for that because I think this is something that is typically overseen or done very quickly, at least in, in physics courses. And I think this is really the crucial part of understanding what the entropy is. Yes, my comment was also related to the same very nice uh, example with uh, 
Mm -hmm. Is there something else? So if not, then I will tease you because tomorrow you'll be really calculating the entropies and I will be calculating the entropies, the Boltzmann entropies that are not the Gibbs entropies. And I will do it not by doing some uh, abstract calculations. I will take real practical systems that you can imagine quite easily and show you how these entropies, how these entropies look like. And you might know them already. So thank you for today and have a good evening. Uh, there is also uh, Lyle in the chat. So you didn't, she didn't know the fact that uh, Boltzmann entropy and the plan was involved. Yeah, I might tell you uh, this funny story uh, uh, tomorrow or watch the video. There is also a nice history about Boltzmann and his, his history. Good. Okay, thank you. Thank you, uh, Jan, for the very nice Interesting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh.